So first, let's take a brief moment of silence for the babies. <laughs> if you get the joke. <laughs> so my, my talk today is not very technical, well, part of it is later on, but I'm just kind of um, going over what kind of criteria you want to follow to evaluate digital currencies. I think there's a, a frenzy of investment and money flowing in, in Korea especially, into digital currencies, but not everyone is well versed on you know, what is a digital currency, what is a blockchain. So I pulled out some data that you know, will shed some light on some of these things. Do I need to point it? So I, need, I do need to point it over that way. Okay, so my name is Samson Mo. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Blockstream. I used to be the COO at BTCC. It was one of the largest exchanges in the world and in China for a while, and also one of the largest mining pools. And before that, I was at Ubisoft. I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast, and I also make hats. You see some of them around the room. Oops. So Blockstream is a blockchain infrastructure company. Uh, we were founded in 2014, um, basically work on protocol level things. We contribute to Bitcoin Core and everything. We're about 45 people spread out around the world. It's a very decentralized uh, company. And these are some of the things that we are working on. So Liquid is our flagship product. It's a sidechain. So the company was actually founded based on the Strong Federation sidechains white paper, which is essentially another blockchain that can be pegged to Bitcoin. And that is actually launching in the middle of May. So it's an inter-exchange settlement network that will link together exchanges around the world and allow people to move funds quickly, take advantage of arbitrage opportunities, and such. And it also has a lot of additional functionality. We can issue assets. We call them IA. Um, basically, it's like a token you can issue within the network. Uh, you can issue um, attested assets for gold bar, silver, or things like that. Um, and also... We have Green Address. It's a non-custodial uh, Bitcoin wallet for iOS and Android. And Elements, which is our blockchain platform. So we have some people that are already doing some proof of concepts with this platform. Um, one of our investors and partners is Digital Garage in Japan, and they have a team called DG Lab that's working on Elements um, as their foundation of their projects. Uh, we also have a really interesting product. It's called Bro Blockstream Satellite. So we have geosynchronous satellites in orbit around the Earth, about 35,000 kilometers out, broadcasting Bitcoin blocks down to Earth. Um, we don't have full worldwide coverage yet, but we should be rolling that out in the next month or, or two. And when that's live, then you can take comfort in knowing that Bitcoin blocks are all around you in Korea. Um, so the point of that is actually... Uh, to build Bitcoin into a robust financial uh, infrastructure. So right now, Bitcoin is limited in some ways by terrestrial internet. So if an undersea cable is cut somewhere to certain, a certain country and they have no internet, then essentially they cannot synchronize with the rest of the blockchain. So there's 10 minutes block, block times, and that time is essential for the network to keep in sync, um, for the entire network all around the world to keep in sync. So what that does is you can still get the blocks and still keep in sync uh, with everyone, even if internet is cut for whatever reason. Um, also, a few months ago, we announced our cryptocurrency data feed. We're missing a word there. Um, this is a data feed we're building in partnership with ICE. ICE is the Intercontinental Exchange, which is the owner of the New York Stock Exchange. So this is a way that we're bringing digital currencies and cryptocurrencies to Wall Street. So it's a feed where we're pulling data from every exchange uh, around the world. We're, we're, we have like 21 exchanges in the feed now, and we're pulling more data in. But this will give institutional investors, traders, uh, and brokerages uh, access to exchange data from around the world. Uh, we contribute to Bitcoin, as I mentioned. We also work on Lightning. Uh, so we're one of the three main implementations of Lightning on the network. There's C Lightning, which is from us, uh, Async and Eclair, and then Lightning Labs with LND. And we recently released Lightning Charge. It's a plugin that lets you build web apps um, on Lightning. And we launched a Blockstream store, which is actually quite popular. We're actually getting about 30 orders a day now um, 
with e-commerce over Lightning. And finally, we have Simplicity. It's a smart contracting language. It's also part of Elements, and this will eventually allow smart contracting to happen within Bitcoin and Bitcoin similar compatible blockchains. Okay, so first of all, I'll talk a bit about market cap. So a lot of people, when looking at digital currencies, they kind of get stuck on market cap. They go to a website like, like Coin Market Cap, and they look at the numbers. Like, you know, there's a Bitcoin market cap at a 112 billion, and how much is the price, and how much is the volume? But market cap is a holdover from uh, stock markets and such. So typically, when you look at these kind of sites listing um, listing stocks. They're on a regulated exchange somewhere, and they're real companies, and they have to publicly publish all their audits. But for cryptocurrencies, a lot of them are just you know, forks, tokens, and this really doesn't explain the value of the currency that well when you're only multiplying out the market cap with the price. So market capitalization is the, it's supposed to be the total value of a company's outstanding shares. Um, it's stock price multiplied by number of outstanding shares. And it's useful for comparing publicly traded companies. And there's a big process to get publicly listed. It's not that easy. Uh, and I think a lot of people mistake digital currencies as a stock. So the, the calculation is just circulating supply uh, multiplied by price. And that's actually very, very simplistic. If I made my own token, if I made Hatcoin, and I have a trillion Hatcoins, and I sold one to, where's Ruben? I sold one for, to Ruben for a dollar. That doesn't mean I have a trillion dollar market cap. It just means I sold one coin for a dollar. But when you look at market cap in the way that most people do, they think that you know, these coins have a lot of value and they're valuable. Um, and what it does is it makes the non-scammy coins, the ones that actually have value, rank lower because of this simple calculation. Um, so it's, it's a comparison metric that's useful, but is mutated in something not useful when applied to cryptocurrencies. So this is breaking down some of the, uh, the top 12. So eight of the top 12 cryptocurrencies as of today and yesterday are instamined or pre-mined. That means when they launched the currency, uh, they basically printed a bunch of it with no effort. Um, Bcash's position as number four is questionable because exchanges set the price at the time of the fork. It didn't start from zero. Uh, coins like Litecoin, Bitcoin, and others, they actually started listing, they started their existence at zero and moved up. But a lot of coins actually were pegged at a certain price. And the same for ICOs. So the way the ICO works is someone decides I'm going to have this coin now and I'm offering it at a certain price, just like an IPO. But they just put a price out and instantly had a market cap. Um, six of the 12 are not mineable and they rely on untested consensus mechanisms. So these are coins that can't actually be mined. And I can touch base on that later why that's important. One of the 12 uh, doesn't have a blockchain and that's EOS. It does not have a blockchain. It's just a, a token at this point, a ERC-20 token. But despite all of this, Bitcoin is still number one. So it gives you some idea to the staying power and resilience of Bitcoin. So market cap is not useful for cryptocurrencies. Holding a share is not the same as hodling a unit of a cryptocurrency. So shares are supposed to represent ownership in a company. So there's a, a, a joke coin a while back. It's called Coinye Coinye. And it's a, basically a joke coin for Kanye West. But if you ha have a Kanye token, it doesn't give you the rights to Kanye West's re revenues and assets. So an another example of that is XRP. XRP is also, Ripple is misleading. There's a company working on a protocol uh, for banks and payments. And then there is a token XRP. But there's absolutely zero relationship between the two. So it's as if I have a car dealership selling cars and I made a car coin token. That token 
can exist on the market. It can be traded and you can buy and sell it. But it has nothing to do with the business selling cars. That's kind of what Ripple is. So let's see. Also, a lot of tokens have large amounts that are locked up, which is not, they're not available on the market. But those amounts are still factored into the market cap. So NEO has half of their entire supply, almost half the entire supply, 50 million of 95 million locked up by the NEO Council. The Ethereum Foundation has 800,000 ETH. And the Ripple Foundation has 50 billion out of the 100 billion Ripple. So when you look at the market cap, you, you can't even trade all of that. It's just pumping up the, the, the price, the, the total market cap. OK, so the next point I want to talk about is the price of coins adjusted for unit bias. Does anyone know what unit bias means? Ruben? I'm not sure it's coming, no. Okay. So it, it's the supply. It, you can say it's the total supply. So everyone knows there are 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. Uh, there are, is a total of 21 million Bitcoin, 16 some odd million that are in circulation, and probably 1 million that we'll never see because those are locked up by Satoshi and he's gone. But if you actually adjusted everything else to account for the unit bias, so if there were only 21 million Ripple, 21 million Ether, Stellar, and so on, then those would be the prices of those coins and tokens. So Ripple is actually the most expensive of everything. When you look at the price, and it's 50 cents right now, it's not really 50 cents. You're actually paying $2,000 for a Ripple token. And if you look at Cardano at 300, 300 is the price of Tesla stock. So a lot of these things are kind of uh, out of whack. It's not really making much sense at this point. And don't forget, EOS does not have a blockchain, and it's $281 if you adjust for the unit bias. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is throughput. So a lot of coins are marketing themselves based on their throughput, how many transactions per second. Um, I've seen a, a diagram from one of the coins, I think it was Ripple, they show uh, um, one dot per second for Bitcoin because Bitcoin's at seven transactions per second and then you know, other coins are more and more and they show themselves kind of flooding through as a river. But that really doesn't matter, first of all, for uh, if you're buying a coin as a store of value, if you're buying it to trade, it doesn't matter even more, but if you're just buying something for store of value, throughput doesn't actually factor into the equation as much as you would think. So these are um, amounts transacted on chain for the past 24 hours in US dollars for some of the currencies. So Bitcoin is the bulk of it. And that is just the on chain amount traded based on um, how much it's worth. So Bitcoin is at $92,592 a second. That's a lot of throughput in terms of value transacted per second. Nothing else really comes close to that. Uh, Ripple doesn't even make the cut. So if you're buying something, you're, you have an asset, it doesn't matter how fast you can move that asset. It ma transaction throughput matters if you're doing payments because you need things to move quickly. But if you're buying a, a, a gold, it doesn't matter. So this is an example. Uh, Germany repatriated uh, 374 metric tons of gold worth around $15 billion. It took them five years to move that from the US and Paris back to Germany at a cost of 7.7 .7 million euros. So it's very expensive and very slow to move this asset. So Bitcoin is actually leaps and bounds faster for moving value and transacting value. Uh, next up is market depth. So. I don't think there is a site, at least I haven't found one, that's aggregating market depth statistics from exchanges. But when I was operating BTCC, we would pull some data and compile it ourselves. And I think you'd probably compile it if you subscribe to the ICE feed. Uh, but this is just an uh, example of um, the order books and market depth bid asks on an exchange. So this actually matters a lot. If you're trying to move money around, you're trying to 
um, access liquidity, you need to look at how much market depth there is available for different coins. If you look at a coin's market cap and you see it's uh, you know, $50 billion or $2 billion, that's great. But when you actually want to sell it and convert to another currency, typically their order books are very thin for these currencies, especially on a lot of the currency pairs of that. Uh, recently, I think uh, Bitcoin, Bit Bcash was removed from one exchange. Like A lot of the currency pairs were removed because there's just no liquidity. Um, code is also very important when valuing digital currencies because a digital currency is code. It's consensus rules codified and run by people enforced by the nodes of the network. So if you're eval trying to decide what you, you're buying and investing without looking at the code, then uh, you're in for a rough time. So I would suggest if you're buying something to take a look at GitHub and take a look at the repos and see how much activity is there uh, for any given coin. Because it's actually very easy to create a token. It's very easy to create an altcoin. It's very easy to create a fork coin. There's a website called ForkChain that lets you punch in a couple parameters so you can make your own Bcash. You can just say, I want a fork at 8 megabytes, and then hit a button, and you have your, your new chain. So Bitcoin, there's 40 authors. This is just the last, last month. There's 40 authors and 142 merged pull requests. There's a lot of activity here. There's a lot of people working on Bitcoin and developing and testing and deploying. For BCH or Bcash, there's 10 authors and nothing happened in the last month. Nothing happened in the last month. Uh, Ripple, they had two pull requests, so that's a little bit better. Uh, Monero, there's serious activity here. There's 16 authors, 62 pull requests. So you need to take a look and see what's actually happening. If uh, you just look at the market cap and you see this coin looks like it's valuable or you're deciding based on the name of the coin without taking a look here, then you're also going to have a bad time. Uh, technology is also very important. A lot of people have a difficult time assessing because this is pretty technical. But you can still look at mainstream media and news reports and see, are there technical issues with this coin? Are people critiquing it? And is that critique being welcomed? And are things being done to fix those issues? So uh, this is just a quote um, from Bruce, Bruce Schneier. In 2017, leaving a crypto algorithm vulnerable to differential crypto analysis is a rookie mistake. Uh, basically, this is a problem with IOTA. Uh, they rolled their own crypto, and it can be uh, easily attacked. So the curl is their hashing algorithm, and it does not have collision resistance. So they were able to find collisions in, uh, w with 80 cores, which is computational power, in just a few minutes. And that means you could essentially falsely sign transactions and uh, print money. Uh, for NEO, they had another problem, which um, they actually had delegated Byzantine fault tolerance as its consensus mechanism, but it, it meant that every node had to be online. So NEO is kind of a, a distributed signing blockchain, but they had a failure where one of the nodes went offline and they just the blockchain just stopped working. These are pretty rookie mistakes, <laughs> and uh, these kind of systems have been developed for a long time, so it's not like it's new technology. Uh, yeah, so this is the news. A single disconnected node can bring down the entire network. Uh, for Ethereum, there's a few hacks. Uh, there's the DAO hack. There's the DAO soft fork DOS vulnerability. There's the DAO hard fork, and then uh, creation of Ethereum Classic. And then there's the Parity multi-signature bug. So Parity was also in the news. It was this guy, DevOps199. He accidentally bricked all the Parity wallets and locked up 150 million ETH. And then there's Bcash. So they promote themselves in a deceptive manner. It's a minority chain. And it's actually very susceptible to 51% attacks. So a lot, of chain, a lot of chains and coins intentionally have a different proof of work algorithm so they're not easily attacked by other chains. So Litecoin is script, and then you have Monero, Crypto Knight, and then Ethereum is GPU mined. But Bcash is still a SHA-256. So any mining pool, I think, I think it's the next slide. Oh, nope. But there's like seven Bitcoin mining pools that could attack Bcash. 
So someone could send a thousand coins, a thousand Bcash to an exchange, um, sell it, withdraw their money, and then have a mining pool attack the chain and reverse that transaction. So there is, there is real risk here, and uh, it's just a big risk to hold some of these coins. Also for Bcash, one of their implementations, Bitcoin Unlimited, actually had a crash, uh, had a crash bug. Twice. And then there's crypto note based coins like Bytecoin uh, that allowed for an unlimited, the creation of an unlimited number of coins in a way that's undetectable to an observer unless they knew about the fatal flaw and can search for it. So, yeah, that's Fluffy Pony, one of the, the lead developer from Nero, posting about that issue. But they fixed it, um, so they, they, they quickly patched it. Uh, then we have Zcash, so their, their whole thing is based on a trusted setup. And there was a news article talking about the same problem where someone's phone was hacked at the trusted setup event. And if their trusted setup was breached, then uh, it, it makes possible uh, undetectable inflation. And again, no one can really know if it's protected or not. And also, the, one of the fundamental use cases for Zcash is that it's a privacy coin like Monero, but nobody, nearly no one uses private transactions or the shielded transaction. So it exists for privacy, but it actually does not fulfill that purpose. Uh, this is Peter Todd, and he's, I think, that's pointing out the, the vulnerability for the trusted setup. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's, a, it's also about the trusted setup. We can skip through it. But the, back to the, um, Privacy, this is the total supply of Zcash, and you can see in blue is the actual shielded pool. So only that amount, those transactions along the bottom, are actually really private. Everything else isn't private. And I think the amount is 0.3% of the transactions in the past month were fully private shielded transactions. So that's also very bad, because recently I think uh, Edward Snowden was recommending Zcash, but being he's a privacy advocate, <laughs> and whistleblower, blower, you probably shouldn't be advocating something that is not very private. And also, 31.5% of Zcash uh, passed through the shielded pool were instantly returned to transparent addresses in a traceable manner via round-trip transactions. So, next topic is the security of the actual chain. So, everyone knows what hash rate is, right? So Bitcoin is still the most secure chain out there. There's 28 exahashes, and um, that's a, a, approximately 1.75 million ASIC miners, which would cost you about $2.3 billion to buy. And that's not including the setup. So if you're actually building out your mining facility, you need to actually build, build the building, have the cooling, the power, transformers, everything, and operational cost. That's just to buy the ASICs. Next you have Bcash, which is two exahash per second. Um, and it's about 122,000 modern ASIC miners, which could be bought for about $0.1 billion. So it's actually not that expensive to um, get that, this much hash rate. And it's 7% of Bitcoin's hash rate. That's why, why any, most of the Bitcoin, major Bitcoin mining pools could attack Bcash if they really wanted to. And then you have Ethereum, their algos, ET hash. They're about 256 terahashes per second, which are roughly 11 million NVIDIA 1080 graphic cards at a cost of 6.5 billion. But recently we found out that um, there are actually ASICs. We don't know how long they've been mining, so that could tweak the number a bit. But still, it's a substantial amount of money to get that amount of hashing power. And then Litecoin, it's also more secure than Bcash at a cost of uh, 0.5 billion to get 397,000 script miners. And Zcash is also 0.5 uh, billion to get 852,000 graphics cards. Um, but one of their mining pools, uh, Flypool, is about 60% of their hash rate. So that's not really good. <laughs> um, 
we're coming close to the end. So next, I want to talk about production costs. So there actually is a cost to produce the coins. So first of all, you need to buy the ASICs, but you also have uh, electrical costs and everything. So this is just a rough calculation based on um, electrical and ASIC cost at 12 cents uh, USD per kilowatt hour. So it costs roughly $4,700 to produce a Bitcoin if you are a miner. Uh, $300 to produce one Litecoin and $600 to produce one Monero. Um, but then you have all the other coins that you can't actually mine. So XRP is pre-mined and then a lot of things are also tokens. So when you, when you are looking at these currencies, you have to know that some of them actually have no cost to produce. I can just bring it into existence by pushing a button. And then decentralization is another factor that you need to look at when evaluating these currencies. Um, so you need to look at the node network. Where are all the nodes in the network? Are they in just a few countries or are they well dispersed geographically? Um, how many mining pools there are and where the mining pools are based? Um, and also who is the ISP provider for the nodes or who, who's hosting the nodes? Because a lot of nodes are actually cloud, are hosted on the cloud. So this is just the the Bitcoin, the nodes of, of the Bitcoin network. So you can see we have a pretty good geographical distribution and these are, these are full nodes. They're economic nodes, they're mining nodes, they're nodes for merchants and everyone like Ruben was talking about earlier. Uh, you're running your own node to validate your own transactions and also enforcing the rules of the network. So these are the Bitcoin mining pools. It could be better, but it's still re recently distributed and within the pools you still have different miners and those miners are starting to spread out geographically. Previously, a lot of mining was done in China, but because China is clamping down on mining, there's been a huge influx of Chinese miners moving out into North America and other regions um, to kind of escape the clampdown. Um, so this is actually a representation of the nodes of uh, Bcash. So, this block there are all on Alien, which is like a Chinese cloud provider. And this is on Alibaba. So a huge chunk of Bcash nodes actually are in China as opposed to being well distributed. And also Amazon is another big chunk right there. So it, it, it's not very organic compared to the Bitcoin network. Also the mining pools, there are a lot fewer of them uh, for Bcash. So in summary, don't look at market cap alone. Don't buy coins that appear cheap. Look at the total supply. Um, I have a friend, he's a miner, and he would sometimes say he buys some Ripple when he has leftover cash because it's like putting his pocket change into something. But you're actually paying a very high dollar amount if you remove that unit bias. Um, determine what is the actual throughput for the value that that coin can transact on the network. And then do your homework and sample market depth on different exchanges and see the order books and see if there are people actually buying and selling it. Look at the code repositories for the coin and check for development activity because it's very easy to make a coin, to list a coin, and there's actually nobody working on it. Nobody really cares about it from the development community. Uh, figure out how the blockchain is secured, if there is a blockchain, and take a look at the risks of attack there. And then research the nodes and mining distributions if you can. And then finally, I'll leave you with uh, the Bitcoin slogan, which is kind of emblematic of how everyone's thinking. So you don't trust, verify. Um, don't just look at the market cap and see the numbers outright and say this is a good buy. Actually do your homework and verify for yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you, anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take some questions. Yes. I have heard that Blockstream is a very famous company and technical company, and uh, I've questioned on the, some kind of technical. Is this possible? Sure. Sure. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And, like, uh, and I, I like the mostly interesting the writing network. Right. You said that I recently had a news that Blockstream released the 
uh, lightning charge. Yes. It's micro payment. And I had another news that there is a denial, denial of service attack on the micro uh, lightning network. Can you explain the what's the lightning charge and the, you how to solve the denial of service? Yeah. Okay, that's a lot of questions in one. So, lightning charge is uh, kind of like a middleware that lets you access uh, see lightning more easily. So it's just a web web app that lets you kind of uh, access the RPC calls in C Lightning um, because it's just making it more accessible. Um, Lightning Charge is kind of bundled with this WooCommerce plugin that we have, so it kind of works together. But you can integrate it into a WordPress site to take Lightning payments. And then on top of Lightning Charge, we have um, Lightning apps. We call them Laps, and those are just different apps that you can use uh, in conjunction with Lightning Charge to do different things like um, sell video, sell pictures, pay for content, um, pay for API calls and everything. So we, we have all those on our website. It's all open source. It's all part of, it's all under the Elements project, open source project. So you can play with it and hack on it and experiment. And the last part was denial of service. Um, wh what's the problem with denial of service? And uh, I heard you said that there is a 10, 10 oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, 1,000 nodes operated in the Lightning Network. One, just that one node is uh, about, and 20% 20, 20 of nodes disappear from the denial of service attack. Okay, I haven't been reading the news this week. Do you know? Uh, so Lightning is now being used um, in uh, um, its beta quality software, and um, when you have uh, a payment network like Bitcoin and now Lightning that, uh, that uses Bitcoin as its currency, uh, where nobody is in control, uh, you need it to be tested in adverse conditions, and it seems someone decided to, to do... Um, uh, a denial of service attack against the lightning nodes. Um, so this has happened many times against Bitcoin, and um, it's actually a good thing uh, that it's being tested in this way, and they're trying many different um, types of attacks to to break the network, and, and the developers um, have been able to to collect a lot of information about what they're trying in order to fix bugs to better guard against this. So uh, the attacks um, actually make the software better and more robust against attacks in the future. Um, but um, as with anything on the internet, if you are merely flooding um, a internet address with a lot of garbage, like there's nothing that can protect against that. But the Lightning Network, um, it, at over a thousand nodes and growing, they will not be able to do that for the entire network in the future, uh, once it, it's in, into the tens of thousands and the hundreds of thousands of nodes. There's real cost to, to do that. Okay. Any other? Thanks. A philosophical question if you want from the strategy point of view. Yes. Do, what do you think is better for the future establishment or implementation of the technology that we still have all these coins complementing and competing against each other or that the resources are focusing Bitcoin and, and, and we focus the technology on developing and improving the Bitcoin blockchain. So the question was, uh, should there be so many coins and should we focus on Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin blockchain? I'm not right? thinking of investment, but on, on actually making the technology mainstream and, and implementing and, and, right, and right, improving right. the technology. Well, it, it's all open source and it is a free market and there is a large opportunity to make money, right? So I think it's inevitable that there would be altcoins. It was inevitable that there would be fork coins because it's easy to make money this way, right? Um, I think there are a lot of developers and a lot of people that are more focused on sound money and the technology behind Bitcoin. So that's why the developer pool behind Bitcoin is the biggest. Um, there will, but there will always be people that want to launch their own coin, launch their own token. And it's, it's just something that uh, we have to educate people on how to evaluate that. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think um, having, having other coins, they can test out other things, right? Like, 
Bitcoin cannot have um, privacy right now, right? But Monero can move ahead on that front. Um, Litecoin activated SegWit before, and it's kind of showing that it, there were a lot of people throwing fud on SegWit, saying it's going to let people steal money. And Litecoin activated, and it shows that it's safe. It's a bug fix, right? So I think there is a place for these coins. It's just there. It's just going to be something that's always there. I think. Okay. Yes. How do we see your government regulation come in a way of uh, Bitcoin adoption? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? How do we see government regulations come in a way of Bitcoin adoption? How do I see government regulations coming the way of Bitcoin? Mass adoption. Mass adoption. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I think uh, uh, Bitcoin is interesting because it, it countries that are favorable to it and favorable to digital currencies in general, um, I guess they're, they're, they have a more, they take more of an interest in the, the interest of their people, I think. They're, there's more freedom um, and liberty, I think. Uh, countries that crack down on them, I think they want to maintain control over the monetary supply. Uh, but I, I think um, countries that embrace digital currencies will be more prosperous down the road because this is, I believe it is the future, right? It's, you're either going down the path of more fiat currency, printed paper, debt instruments, derivatives, or you have sound money based on Bitcoin. You have finite amount of a uh, store of value that is reliable and immutable. So I, I think adoption, there will always be friction, but you know, people will always find a way. Um, the recent uh, regulation in India, I think, is the banks cannot uh, let, let people transact, um, let, let them send money to exchanges, right? But actually, China had that same thing come out in 2013, right? But for the three years after that, there's still a lot of exchanges in China. So people will find a way to continue buying. But as the money supply moves into digital currencies and it's onboarded from different regions, it becomes less of an issue how you onboard the fiat, right? You can onboard the fiat from other countries. Um, just like there's USDT, that is you know, several billions of dollars that, of fiat currency that has been onboarded into the digital currency ecosystem. And that's not going away. So as long as you have these pegs and bridges, and there are countries with favorable regulation, I don't really see that anyone can really stop the advance of digital currency. All right. So, Lightning, yes. Lightning Network, like, what kind of like, timeline do you expect in terms of adoption of like, market And also, like, timetable <coughs> for the technical development? So the question is, uh, what kind of timeline do I expect for development of Lightning and the technical development, right? Also, market adoption. A market adoption, right, right. So I'm, I'm actually surprised at how fast Lightning um, a development has been and how fast adoption has been. Like, I, I think we're actually at 3,000 Lightning nodes now, not 1,000. And it, it, it's like been ballooning, and I think I don't want to take credit, but <laughs> launching the Blockstream store really jump-started use on mainnet. And we took some flack from um, some people saying, you know, it's reckless. But it is reckless, but it's also permissionless technology. Bitcoin is actually still in beta. It's at 0 0.16. It's not version 1.0 right now. Um, as for adoption, it's really just what do people want to do. And I think a lot of people want to use Lightning. Um, a lot of people see the potential, and they see that there's so much different things that you can do with it because now you can have instant free programmable money um, in every technology. Like the laps that we released, you know, they cover so many different aspects from e-commerce to you know, doing cool things like um, paying for a jukebox or whatever, right? But the excitement in the space is similar to when Bitcoin first came out. And I think what we see organically is that a lot of people are buying things from our store, our Lightning store on the weekend. So what my guess is that they're doing their day job and on the weekend they want to hack on this technology. And that's why we see like, our orders spike on the weekend because people are setting up nodes, um, you know, compiling it, running it, and making these purchases to test it. Uh, as for timelines, it's really hard to say. Like, it's happened so fast. Like Lightning, only two of the, the implementations are actually in beta. We're not in beta yet. We haven't announced that it's in beta. It's been, the store has been live for what, two, three weeks? 
four weeks. But this is really, really early, but already so many people are using it. Async recently released their wallet, their mobile wallet on Android. But, and then there's also Zap, the Zap wallet. But everyone is moving so fast. And I think uh, uh, part of that is just to show people that this is real technology and to also find the place, find out how to apply it to new use cases. Because if you're a first mover in this space and you can um, apply it in interesting ways, then you will have an advantage. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's the Lightning Network right now. <laughs> so it is several thousand nodes, at least 3,000 from last, last I checked. Yeah. Question? Uh, well, thank you, Samson, for your presentation. And, um, well, you, you've introduced some of um, the important points to consider in evaluating cryptocurrency. And in the beginning, you uh, compared the cryptocurrency market to the stock market, where public companies at, uh, in the states are required to um, publish audits, whereas uh, well, cryptocurrencies are not exempt from those regulations or requirements. Um, do you see, um, well, in your viewpoint, do you, uh, is there any room for uh, the cryptocurrency ecosystem to be governed by um, similar um, like regulation or uh, requirements that are currently uh, being utilized in the stock market. Okay, so the, the question is, is there room for regulation like of cryptocurrencies like a stock market? Well, I don't really think um, you can fully regulate. You can regulate exchanges, but you cannot regulate the actual currency if it is decentralized enough. And that's why part of the presentation is to say, really see how decentralized this currency is. Ripple can be shut off. People are saying now that Ripple is a security because they, there has been new, have been news reports saying that they're telling exchanges that we'll give you a million dollars to list Ripple or we'll loan you 100 million Ripple if you list it, right? And that means it's kind of a, <laughs> an enterprise for a, an endeavor to gain, right? And it is a security. So that can be shut down. But if it's a really decentralized currency like Bitcoin, no one can shut that down. And you can regulate certain aspects of it, like from an exchange point of view, from a banking point of view, but you can't regulate the Bitcoin itself or Litecoin itself or Monero itself. Can I add just one? Um, well, then, um, okay. from, well, if you look into the stock market, um, well, the government or SEC is um, evaluating all, all the, the derivatives or stocks on behalf of the investors, whereas in, in the cryptocurrency market, um, it is up to us, investors, to evaluate um, all those currencies by ourselves. Uh, um, then is there any possibility that um, government or public organizations could um, evaluate, uh, could assume the task of evaluating the currencies uh, just as um, it is done in the stock market, like SEC? Right. So, uh, um, hmm. well, <laughs> I don't really think it's possible. Like there may be some, they can maybe make a website like CoinMarketCap and um, do more detailed analysis and break things down and kind of rank things differently. But I don't think it can be really regulated because these are just uh, assets, they're commodities and they can be freely traded even outside of an exchange. Okay, all right, yes. Uh, speaking of regulation, um because I'm not a security investor in this area, so I'm just wondering about how to uh, discern security tokens from utility ones. I mean, there are some to tokens which are much closer to uh, securities instead of to uh, you know, utility tokens. So could you uh, tell us more about the criteria uh, based on which you can you know, tell, tell which are securities and which are uh, utility tokens? Um, well, a security token means that it is trying to generate value in some way or generate some return, right? If it's a utility token, it's supposed to be just used as, you know, a token to use some service of some service or a network, right? Um, but it's pretty clear in general, but the problem is how they market themselves. Like even utility tokens can market themselves as security sometimes, and that's where 
things get problematic. But uh, I think the SECs, at least first right now, they're going after the more uh, abrasive ones that are outright scams. And I think they're looking at everything, but it, it's quite subjective, right, in a lot of ways to determine if it's a security or not a security. But uh, uh, in the case of uh, POS, um, you know, some master nodes get, can get some returns uh, based on their holdings. So in this case, can it be, uh, you know, in some ways, um, classified as a uh, security token? Sorry, can you catch that? Can you say that? Uh, my point is that uh, there are some structures where uh, master nodes um, can earn some rewards from the system. So in that case, can they be classified as security tokens? Well, the SEC can say anyone's a security. <laughs> it's just if they, you're on their radar and they want to. Yeah. Right. So, uh, okay, one last one. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very informative. And I, I'm, I'm a supporter of the side chain. So, and I, I, I like the idea of the bloodstream satellite. And so, yeah, I pretty much agree with you for the presentation content and even I can summarize your presentation like uh, at the moment only Bitcoin, not other coin. Well, I didn't say that, but <laughs> if that's your conclusion, that's a, I think it's a fair conclusion. That's my perspective. So, uh, I, my question is about your company, Blackstreet. Yes. Uh, I just wonder, what, what is your cash cow or how you make the profit? Oh, okay. How does Blockstream make profit? So <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the second question is, who is your major investor? Okay. Uh, and the second is, the third is, uh, is there any way as an in individual to invest in your company? Okay. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, how do we make money? Who are investors and can you invest in Blockstream? So I'll, I'll go in reverse. So. Um, we're a VC-funded company, so it's, it'd be hard to um, invest in Blockstream at this point. Um, we're, we typically take money from venture capital. So we're, we raised a, a seed round of $21 million, and then we raised a Series A round for about $60 million. So we have about $80 million. Um, we're pretty frugal, so we have a lot of money still in the bank. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not in a rush. We've spent a lot of time... So we were founded in 2014. We spent a lot of time actually doing R&D. And I think this year and part of last year is when we're actually gearing up for uh, commercialization of some of the technology. So Liquid uh, as a sidechain is one of the first commercial applications of that. And we, we actually have to spend a lot of time building this, um, this, this product because there's a hardware component. We build our own customized hardware. There is um, uh, a functionary box. It's a hardware security module inside a box that the functionaries of the network have to run and there's a software component. Uh, but that will launch and that will generate, that's a revenue stream for us. So we have a service agreement with exchanges in the network uh, that will pay us to help them be a technology provider and operate that network. And also we can do interesting things in Liquid like issue tokenized fiat currencies like tokenized uh, USD or tokenized JPY. And we can take a percentage uh, basis points of transactions of those currencies in the network. So that's one revenue stream. Um, the other revenue stream is data feed, um, which is, uh, yes, that one, the cryptocurrency data feed. So this is a partnership with ICE. So we share revenue with them on sales of that feed. And that should be a nice chunk of revenue for us. Um, and the first question was, who are investors? Or the second question, um, there's Reid Hoffman. He was a large investor of our seed round. He is the co-founder of LinkedIn. Uh, we also have Digital Garage in Japan. It's a publicly traded company. Um, we have Horizons Ventures in Hong Kong. Um, that's a venture fund from uh, Lee, Lee Kaching. Um, and who else is there? Kosla Ventures and a lot of others. Now, how many engineers working for your company? Uh, I think we're about 50% engineer, so maybe 20 or so engineering in our engineering team. Uh, we also have a lot of... Um, R&D type roles too. We have cryptographers, mathematicians, what else? Yeah, and Warren Solutions. Yeah. How many people? Uh, 45. Maybe, maybe more now. We did some hiring. So we're actually growing this year. We're going to ramp up to probably 70 people. Yeah. All right, so 
hand it back to Ruben. Thank you. Thank you.